Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> Are you guys having fun? Good. These sessions have been amazing. I'm learning a lot from all of you. I'm really glad you're here. Uh, a couple of announcements before I introduce our plenary this afternoon. Uh, just so you guys all know, we're organizing tours of campus and we'll just be I mean, just say, we'll just be organizing those right outside these doors after we finish here. Um, so if you're interested in a tour, we have some, um, we have some students who are going to guide you around and do kind of fun scavenger hunts and all kinds of things that I can't even describe to you. It's so wonderful. Uh, and then we're going to have a big bash over at the Civic Center and you will be led over there. It's going to be fun. All right. Uh, so for our main event this afternoon, we are very, very honored to have four uh, representatives from the Matthew Shepard Foundation. These guys work out of Denver, uh, and we've tried to have keep a close relationship with the Matthew Shepard Foundation. They are doing incredible work. Uh, Judy and Dennis Shepard, of course, have made it their life work to reach out and challenge uh, prejudice against LGBT people and and their work is going across the globe and um, they're tireless advocates and we're honored to be part of their sphere and to be continuing what work we can do here in Wyoming uh, they are going to introduce themselves as they as they go through so I just uh, want to say we're we're so honored to have you we're thrilled you're here uh, and we just want you to come back every year. So thank you so much for being here. Let's give them a big welcome. Hello, thank you uh, all for coming. Um, my name is Sean. I am the communications associate at the Matthew Shepard Foundation. I'm joined here today by Susan Burke, right here to my right, our Laramie Project Specialist, and our executive director, Jason Marsden, and then right at the end there, Christine Romero, uh, Matthew's Place Editor. Um, we're all here today because we all have very unique and extreme backgrounds in media, both in what we do at the foundation and both in our lives previous to this. And what we're talking about today is kind of a challenging approach to media. We saw the theme for this year and we sat down at a conference table and this really hit home for us as a foundation. In our history, we have a unique relationship in being in a media-driven world. And it was our goal to come here today and kind of challenge the future generation of social justice leaders in what their relationship, understanding, and perspective on media is. We experience a lot of outrage, and this is an emotionally charged industry that we work in, and we're very passionate about these things. But we're starting to see a pattern where this disruption of social justice is stepping over each other rather than working toward a progressive goal in achieving equality, achieving civil rights, and achieving human rights. Because of our unique history in this and how we have had to deal with it over the past few years, I wanted to briefly pass the mic over to Jason and Susan who have a very extensive history with both the story of Matt and of the foundation itself. And I want them to just kind of briefly let you know where we stand and what our relationship with that is. Oh, all right then. Howdy, I'm Jason Marsden. I'm the executive director of the foundation and uh, about to mark my sixth anniversary of doing this work, but I was a friend of Matt Shepard's. My, my husband uh, was a classmate. We've been around um, and you have, in addition to four Matthew Shepard Foundation staffers in front of you, you have four ex-journalists who somehow all four of us ended up at the foundation by different paths, but we all come out of the media world um, and I think have the perspective of being the bedraggled reporter trying to put a story together in addition to being the person who is uh, forced into the mold of a preconceived notion of a story, misquoted, um, or has their point missed. We've, I think all four of us, been both of those people at many times, so. Um, where to begin? Um, obviously, Matt Shepard was a 21-year-old student here at the university in the fall of 1998. He was abducted, beaten, and uh, left for dead uh, out in Sherman Hills. Uh, he was found uh, and was comatose at Poudre Valley Hospital for several days 
in early October 1998 and became during those days a, a regional and then a national and ultimately an international news story. Um, there was outrage about the hate crime element of his murder uh, that stretched the globe. Uh, at his funeral, I saw Channel 30 something from uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. I saw public television from Japan, People Magazine, the New York Times, every media outlet, MSNBC. Uh, City Park in Casper was surrounded by satellite trucks uh, at the ensuing trial. Here in Laramie at the courthouse, there were probably twice as many media up uplink vehicles. So this became a big, big thing. And I have a lot of theories about why, but we're not really here to talk so much about that as the fact that it did happen. Uh, and so Matt and the people of Laramie and the people who attacked him and the people who were just ordinary bystanders all found themselves portrayed, not just in a story or a set of stories, but in an ongoing multi-year media narrative that now occurs also on, on the stage, uh, as the Laramie Project does, in film, there have been a few documentaries, and, and uh, in American history textbooks now. So this story was greatly mediated uh, by uh, other people who uh, felt it was their role and their job to assemble and put the story together. Um, I, I was tangentially involved. I was a reporter at the Casper Star Tribune at the time and wrote an opinion column, but I was not involved in the direct coverage. But on my left here, Susan Burke, um, those of you um, of, of our generation might remember her from K2. She was the news director and anchor for many years. Should I let you talk a little bit about the media yeah, itself? I? Sure. Um, as Jason said, I, I was, um, at the time that Matthew was murdered, I was the executive producer and senior anchor at K2. Um, so it was up to me to implement the coverage of everything that was happening. So, you know, his discovery, his hospitalization, the candlelight vigils that occurred, you know, not only here in Laramie, but also in Casper. Um, his death, the funeral, which occurred in Casper. Um, and the subsequent trials. And so I was in charge of trying to do our coverage, which as you know, in Wyoming, we don't have that many TV stations. And so, you know, the NBC affiliate was trying to do it all. Um, I was uh, a reporter with Jason, incidentally. We spent a lot of time in courtrooms and such together um, reporting at the same time. And one of the unique perspectives I think that we have, um, you watching from where you were and me being in the thick of it, was that, watching all the national media come in and twist the tail or just cover the very bare bones of it and not getting any of the layers. I don't know how you felt about it really, but one of the things that I, right now my position with the, um, with the foundation is that I support productions of the Laramie Project, which portray what happened in the town of Laramie, including that, that you know, descent of the media upon them. And one of the things that I found was that I, it was very difficult and I was, I was very angry with the national media for not trying to tell the true story. I mean, I felt like, I felt like Matt was, you know, he was our child. He was our young man. And um, there was a lot of pushback, I think, from those of us who were local, meaning Wyoming, of trying to keep these people at bay and tell the true story of what was going on and a thorough story of what was going on. Did you feel that way as well? So, you know, standing out in the park at the funeral with all of those satellite trucks and all of these people and all of that brass and all of that noise and these parachute journalists coming in and, you know, on the airplanes and they do their little bit and then they, you know, be rude to the people and they would rude to the local journalists and then they would, you know, fly out again was really gave me a, you know, it's no wonder Judy doesn't like the media in a lot of way, shape, and form, especially because of that. But that was sort of my perspective of what was going on media-wise, you know, with Matthew. So I guess to bring this part of it home, what we ended up with was Matthew Shepard, a symbolic name uh, representing victimhood in a particular type of crime at a certain time and place. And the actual person was lost in all of that. And I think a lot of people who have found themselves or their loved ones the subject of media coverage, I think, I think we all know this instinctively, that once, you, once you're out there, you become a character. 
Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation, but it created this legacy, and in many ways it created the foundation, because so many people heard about this worldwide that they started sending greeting cards and sympathy cards and letters and emails to the shepherds, and a lot of people put $10, $20 bills in those cards, and all of a sudden there was a small nest egg um, with which something could be done in Matt's memory, and it was the existence of this unasked for generosity from the broad stranger public that led the shepherds to believe that they were being told they had a moment to do something. And so they created the foundation and it, we're nearing our 17th anniversary now uh, of the work that we're all doing there. Uh, but it's, it's because the, a cry of the heart went up from people, um, which would not have happened without the media coverage. And so uh, it's a little ironic that you have four people from the media world in front of you who have all left it for one reason or another to go work somewhere that was created by a media phenomenon here today to tell you how dangerous those media phenomena are. <laughs> so that's what we'll be talking about the rest of the hour. Um, who leads this next part? But can I just say one quick thing to the, oh, great, I like that. Um, another thing that happened too, just real quickly, and I think that you all living in Wyoming are aware of it, is that because of this media sensation, the state of Wyoming got a reputation as being a very homophobic, anti-gay state, you know, rather than, in, I guess I'll just leave it at that, because you know, I mean, when people say Laramie, and it's in the play, The Laramie Project, we've become a noun. You know, Laramie is like Jasper, it's like Waco. You know, it's a terrible place where terrible things happen. And that's how we were all portrayed in the media at the time, and that can, is consistent. I can tell you when I travel the country, they still say the same thing. Sorry. No, you're fine. So, as Jason alluded to, there was, we, we were founded on this huge media coverage and this backlash and this outrage. But over the years, this narrative was perpetuated that we never really supported or never really put out there ourselves. This legacy of Matthew Shepard, kind of the person getting lost in it, the town of Laramie being built up to be something it wasn't, a whole state being labeled as this hate-filled homophobic place. And most of it was not represented by any of that coverage at all. Most of Laramie was not represented. And the reason that we use that as a foundation for this presentation is the idea of you lose control over your message, over your narrative so easily when you're so quick to invite the media into it. Um, I have here a quote from a recent um, blog post that was on the Washington Post just to kind of call out the irony of the situation where here we have civil rights movements and human rights movements that are shaped by narratives that are labeled, later um, fabricated or found to be false or not to totally true in nature. And here you have the Washington Post calling out civil rights initiatives for using false narratives that the media themselves are perpetuating on a day-to-day -day basis because we live in a clickbait view ratings media world. Real quick, um, just because of the difference between our story in 1998 and 2015 that we live in now, Media is much more accessible and much larger than we ever could have imagined back in 1998. This is beyond the mainstream media. This is films, this is television, this is art, this is advertisements, social media, blogs. Social media actually is mainstream media now. But you have so many different ways of communicating a message and anything that does that has to be considered media. CNN, Fox, your local newspaper, those are not the only things you're limited to, and those are not the only things we're talking about here today. Because of this, you can curate media much more personally than you ever were before. In 1998, when Susan was anchoring this story, she was the voice and of, of that news direction. Now, you can listen to whoever you want, you can follow whoever you want, you can find whatever you want and put it on a page that only you see, and you're getting the information that you want. This makes it a much more diverse and harder industry to navigate. We also live in a time where news reporting is not so much about here are the facts, here's the event, but what's the social commentary on it? It's more of a discussion that people are joining into and facts kind of filter in as they come. Turn to any 24 news hour channel and you'll see what I mean. We also have a lot more voices in there. This is not just people who are news directors or editors or producers. These are all of you in this room. Everyone here is a part of the media contribution now. We create it, we engage in it, and we consume it. 
as a backlash of that, there has been in the past couple of years a new definition of outrage culture with our digital media and the expansion of it. And this really stood out to me. This is from the Atlantic, kind of about outrage culture, but this started as a way to mimic the old marches and the old rallies where you're keeping people in check and you're using your outrage to bring about change, which is really what it should be and that's what people are trying to do. They're trying to use their voices to make a positive effect on society. But what we're seeing and what is not healthy for social, social justice movements is when someone is being represented by the media, when a story is picked up, when something's carried across the newswire, and if it's not your specific specialty in social justice, people are getting angry. And they're cutting the other down of, why would you talk about this when we're here? Why is their issue more important than mine? Why don't I matter as much? Why are they getting airtime and we're not? And it becomes a cycle of cutting each other down to boost attention for ourselves because we're measuring things in airtime. We are not in competition. We are all fighting in the fight for equality, no matter what faction you are, whatever letter in the acronym of the LGBT spectrum you are, we're all working toward the same goal. And we all come from different places and have that. But when it comes to getting that media attention, for some reason, we're so quick to cut each other down. I wanna pass it over to Susan because we encounter this a lot in what we do, specifically with our story in relation to Matt and who he was. And um, Susan, who conducts talkbacks for the Laramie Project all over the country, all over the world, recently had an incident that kind of perfectly summarized what we're dealing with. Yeah, this happened in Portland, Oregon. Um, I was at Clackamas Community College and we were um, doing a talkback session. We do the play and then we invite the audience to say and stay and talk about you know, what they've seen and the issues and the relevance of it and where they see hate within their own community and try to come up with solutions. And um, when we opened it up to questions, there was a lady in the audience who said, why are we sitting here talking about a beautiful, white, young, privileged male instead of the trans women of color that are all being murdered right now? And specifically, um, Gwen, I'm gonna get the name wrong, Arahu? you know, who was murdered a few years after Matt. And that really took me back. It's like, well, for one thing, we just didn't see a play about Gwen. You know, it's not that, it's not that we are putting her or that issue aside, it's that this is what we're talking about right now. And that was, that's a perfect example of what we get. I've had it happen before that I'm doing a talk back and someone will stand up and say, why are we talking about this when so many black children are being murdered in Atlanta? I'm not making that up. It's like, well, because that's not what we're focused on right now. You know, the story of Matt opened up this conversation in 1998, and the fact that it got so much attention opened up the conversation in a way that we had never seen before. None of, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this. I wouldn't be sitting here talking about the Laramie Project if that hadn't happened. But I think that's an example of how people start getting you know, hey, how come we're talking about this and not my issue when we should be all working together to solve issues? Does that kind of summarize it? Yeah. Okay. This is a lot of times, it's the explosion that we see, that moment where you're kind of pushed over the edge and you see an injustice happening and because you're so passionate and you're so dedicated to finding the right representation and getting this issue out there and really making change that you start to gripe with one another about who gets priority. You know, who, who has the loudest voice and who's gonna get the airtime for this? It's a natural frustration. It's a natural thing to feel outraged at this. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be. And social justice should be outraged. It, once again, very emotionally charged. But the biggest issue that you have with that is when you're making these claims of, you know, what's happening in Ferguson is in that community, yet we have bullied teens, LGBT youth who are killing themselves every day. And then that statement right there is a huge oversimplification of the issue. It's misrepresentative of what's really happening. You're kind of putting ideas in people's head of what the social justice is because not all bullying leads to suicide. It's not that black or white. It's a very gray area. There's a lot that you can say out of anger and out of frustration that is later gonna be a lot of editor's notes at the top of an article. I just threw a couple of these up here because in the past year, there's been arguments back and forth between all of this, between who's more important, who do we prioritize, what's the biggest issue. 
what's the, you know, defining what the civil rights issue of our era is. And everything you're looking at from free speech to human rights abroad, racism, sexism, Islamophobia, transphobia, what's happening in Ferguson, happening all over the country related to that, they're all equally important. One, being in a headline for 15 minutes, because that's how long it will be there, does not indicate that it is more than or others are less than. Social justice needs to get the perspective of everything that they can and use it as part of a unified movement rather than trying to break it up and put themselves at the top of the totem pole. Recently, we saw a huge example of this back home. There was the Creating Change Conference in Denver. And before the mayor was supposed to speak, a protest broke out. And this was, you know, this is the, the task force, LGBTQ+, everything related seminar from racism to transphobia to sexism to everything. Everything was being discussed, everything was being workshopped, people were there to share ideas, very similar to how we're all here now. And there was this moment of disruption and it was taking time away from people in the SAVE movement fighting for the same cause for them to hold up their signs. And it reinforced this idea of competition that can't exist if there's really going to be progress for all of us. Again, measuring the significance of your movement in airtime, in being quoted in an article or making the headline or being on primetime news is not what you should be prioritizing. You lose control. You should not be so trustworthy of an industry that can get it so wrong. And that's what we're gonna move to now. I'm gonna pass it over to Jason real quick about losing that message and losing control of what your goal is. So to build off that example, at Creating Change in February, the um, staunchly progressive African-American mayor of Denver, whose gay brother died of AIDS, went to speak to a conference of over 4,000 LGBTQ activists for whom the city rolled out its red carpet and recruited to hold that event there. And he went to welcome them and he was greeted by a protest over the happenstance that a few days earlier um, an identified lesbian teen uh, was shot by police in an unclear situation uh, in which she was driving a vehicle that had been reported stolen and police say she was driving it at them. Uh, whether this will turn out to be an abuse of force case or uh, not is being investigated um, appropriately uh, by the department um, whose African-American chief has been an outstanding and vocal supporter of cracking down on police corruption since he arrived at what was a fairly troubled police department a few years ago. So here's a lot of progressivism in front of this group that is itself a transformative progressive force, but they found themselves in conflict because um, of this individual case that happened. Um, some activists felt that they should am have an ambush protest and ultimately Mayor Hancock was not able to give his remarks. And so do you suppose the evening news in Denver led with all of the progressive goals and accomplishments being discussed in our city uh, by thought leaders in this area at a national and internationally respected conference? Or did it lead with angry people chase Hancock out of the building and the message was completely surrendered? Those people who took that protest into their own hands took away the opportunity for the city to showcase its justifiable pride in doing this for, for creating change and for the task force, took away from themselves and their own movement the credibility that comes with decorum and timing and other good sense about where and when protests should be held, and no advancement was made on issues of LGBTQ equality or on issues of police brutality and inappropriate use of force against, in particular, minority communities. No progress was made whatsoever. The three-ish million of us who live in that metro area uh, learned from our media that a bunch of progressive people were yelling at each other down at the Sheraton the other day. Sounds, you know, 
that sounds like a mess. What was that all about? That's the impression that's left with the community. And so the opportunity for numerous positive advances in the conversation with the public was sacrificed by this, uh, what I would call a showboating moment that didn't really need to happen. It certainly didn't need to happen then. And so that's, that's an example of what I, we, we mean when we talk about surrendering control of the message. When you put yourself in a position that will produce spectacle, you are inviting cameras and reporters and notebooks and radio and um, essentially saying make yourselves at home. And, and they certainly will. And anything you do in the camera's unblinking view will be remembered and it'll be filed away as file footage and they can use it for the rest of time. Fred Phelps, you know, Fred, that you all know about Fred Phelps, the Westboro Baptist Church cult out of Topeka, Kansas that goes around waving signs that say, God hates fags. Reverend Phelps passed away a year or two ago, but he thought he was in ministry. He really thought he was communicating with people. What he was doing was making an absurd spectacle out of fundamental, fundamentalist Christianity. Uh, and inviting ridicule. He was doing the exact opposite of what he intended to do because he could not see himself through the lens of a camera uh, the way the rest of us see him. So, um, Christine, I think it's your turn. We need to hear from you. Did you want to talk, Sean? No. Okay. Um, so I'm going to transition it a little bit. I oversee our youth resources website. Um, so we focus on LGBTQ plus youth, 13 to 25. Um, we have a whole collection of bloggers who identify in various ways across the spectrum. And um, we're gaining um, ground in terms of some of our um, other content that looks at um, issues like asexuality, trans issues, intersex issues. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to talk about in particular with regard to media coverage is something that I have been um, interested and sort of passionate about for a long, long time. Um, I come from the reporting world. I was a reporter for over a decade and had been involved and still am involved with the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association. And one of the interesting things the NLGJA has done is taken and made a style book which is something that journalists use to help guide our language and the way that we talk. And so some of these things that you'll see in articles, you'll still see, they're still out there. It's, you can go looking for it, you'll find it. Um, they're small, it's detailed, but these kinds of things in these language, the language that you see matters. And so some of these kind of troublesome phrases that you'll see or that you'll hear are things like the gay agenda, the gay lifestyle, you'll hear transgendered id, transgendered id, because I'm lesbian did, of course not. You wouldn't say someone that they're gayed, oh, they're gayed, you wouldn't say that, so it's transgender. Um, you'll see things like avowed or admitted homosexual. And you know, interestingly, when I was Googling that phrase, um, this is one thing that the Boy Scouts are talking about right now, and this is in their membership manual. It says, we do not grant membership to individuals who are open or avowed homosexuals. And so that, that phrase, it, it, it's weighty, it holds a lot, and it, it tells something about what they think or how they think. Um, sexual preference is another one you'll see, um, when it really is sexual orientation, um, special rights, and I'll also see um, homosexual used a lot, and I'll hear that a lot. And I even hear it a lot from young people who I work with. And it always surprises me, because coming from the journalism world, homosexual is this big long word, and gay is so much easier and shorter, <laughs> so why wouldn't you just say gay? But the other piece of it is, is that homosexual, um, it sexualizes things, it makes people think that all this is about is sex, and that's all that gay and lesbian people care about, when in reality there are these rich lives that it's not just about sex, and that's not what relationships are about, but they're, it's still out there and you'll see it. Um, another piece that you'll see is um, a misgendering of gender nonconforming people in obituaries or in crime stories. 
um, and you'll see people, um, you'll see something that says something to the effect of a man dressed as a woman was found murdered or found killed, whatever. Um, without taking into account that perhaps this wasn't a man dressed as a woman, this was maybe a trans woman. Um, and so you'll see these kinds of misgenderings. Um, and so those are some of the, these are, they're, they're small, it feels nitpicky to focus on these kinds of little things, but I think that when you're looking in the larger media world, there are journalists who haven't um, taken the time to educate themselves, or they haven't had someone sit down and educate them on why language matters, why it matters what we say and how we say it, um, because it is a reflection and it creates thoughts in people's minds that can hold back on social progress. And it isn't so much even social progress, but when you look at it from a journalism perspective, it isn't fair and it isn't accurate. And, and those are the things that journalists try to hold themselves to is fairness and accuracy. And it really isn't fair and it isn't accurate. So <clears throat> you're losing control of your, your narrative a lot. You're kind of surrendering the idea of what message you want to convey to people. And you're surrendering it to an industry that is often not educated enough to really handle the issues in the first place. Christine just named about a dozen examples of where this can go wrong and how the buildup of that takes away the credibility of what we do and how, of how people view us and how they interact with us, their understanding of what the issues are. And so showing hostility between one another and what we're doing and who deserves that spotlight is the opposite of progress and the opposite of the right direction to go. It's not a place where you should throw your trust in wholeheartedly and hope that it's gonna bring about change. If anything, when we, when we see these other things in the news, in the mainstream media being, popping up on our social media pages, Twitter, timelines, everything like that, as social justice leaders, you need to be more active listeners in this case. You need to see what these other perspectives are and what these other movements are being highlighted for and need to see how they apply to you and how you can use that to move forward, how you can build upon it. We all build upon one another. One issue of progress opens the door for three more conversations into something else. We've been dealing with civil rights for ever and you'll see some movements that are still continuing on for decades and decades and decades and progress is slow. And rather than cut each other down, it's about getting all the help we can and bringing and highlighting everything that we can. That's the point I just made. Okay, so kind of going back to, you know, we've been talking a lot about news and mainstream media and all of that idea, but let's go back to the idea of advertisements, brochures, flyers, videos, podcasts, anything like that. We have so much accessibility and it's so easy to produce this stuff that rather than rely on a newspaper or a broadcast channel or a radio station to help get our story out there, we need to be our own producers. We need to be using media as a tool for ourselves rather than something we're relying or depending on. We've seen a lot of that here even being presented at this conference. We've been seeing, you know, th there are the sketches people are performing, highlights of student films happening at this campus, photography collections that are happening where it doesn't matter if, you know, NPR is picking up on it, but these people are in communities and they're talking with real people and sharing real stories. And we all have the ability to do that. That is what we at the foundation are very, very focused on doing. Our idea is to get out there wherever we're at and just encourage others to listen to what we have to say, listen to our stories, go home and then share theirs. And then when they're sharing stories with other people, have them share theirs and have this domino effect where there is more representation in this. You realize these are the people you know, that this is in your community. It's not somewhere far away. It's not just in Ferguson. It's not just throughout Africa and Europe. It's home. It's where you're at. And you don't need a headline or a news camera pointed at you to get that message across. We have from Matthew's Place to traveling exhibits of letters, Laramie Project, and kind of our grassroots efforts at home and abroad, we really bring this issue home and try to get into the community as much as possible. Um, Susan, I'm gonna to go to you now, and I want you to kind of just really outline what it is we do at Talkbacks, what we do with the Laramie Project and all of that. 
So um, how many of you have heard about the play or seen the play or been in the play, The Laramie Project? Oh, a few. Um, it's a play that was um, created by a New York theater company, Tectonic Theater Project. They started coming to Laramie uh, in the weeks following Matt's murder. And in short, it is a play that is of a documentary nature, and it, it is about the town of Laramie. It tells the story of Matt's murder, but it is about the town of Laramie and how people reacted, and you sort of see all sides. One reason why we heavily support this is because it is documentary. These are the people's words. This is what happened. It is what was written. It's not somebody's artistic, you know, um, you know, opera that they've created about the story, and one of the reasons why um, the shepherds support it so wholeheartedly. What I do is, as Sean said, you know, I travel around the country or work on Skype sessions or through the computer or whatever to help support productions of the Laramie Project. Um, I usually do anywhere between 65 and 100 um, pr different productions with different entities a year, so I stay kind of busy. Um, but one of the things that I really love to do is when I'm on site, um, I, we do post-show discussions, as I mentioned before, and what we can do is talk to people about what's happening specifically within their town. So that's really where we wanted to go. What is happening within your community, whether your community is your church, whether it's your family, whether it's your town, your campus, your school, whatever your community is, what is happening where you are? So what is your story? What do you see? What do you think that you can do to stand up and try to help change things, what obstacles are in your way. So that way we get to reach out and get people not on a preachy level like, you know, I'm going to tell you what you can do. It's getting people to really think and tell their story, their own story. Again, as Sean said, we feel that's really, really important because instead of it being a label, then suddenly it's your brother or your uncle, you know, or your best friend at school. It's their story rather than just, you know, and I'll tell you, I was just at um, the Iowa Governor's Conference for LGBTQ youth um, last weekend. Um, a thousand young people, a thousand of them from all around the state of Iowa, mostly rural communities and also educators and counselors and other people all assembled for this conference for this weekend. It was the most amazing thing and one of the things that I found most troubling was you know I had a, a table with our information when we were during the workshops how many people didn't know who Matthew Shepard was and you know and that's not like a personal dig oh they don't know my foundation that wasn't it at all it's just this is a, a linchpin this was a, a watershed moment in history of how we as I said before we can start talking about this and young people didn't know who he was, or they said, oh, I've kind of heard about that, or oh, I saw that play. Ding, 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 they saw the play. They're doing the play. So that's one reason why we figure this is so important, because this is one of the most highly produced plays, this and the second play, Laramie Project, 10 years later, in the United States. And it's of the top, I think, five this year of high schools that produce these plays. So obviously the issues are still relevant. Obviously people are still thinking about it and it keeps the dialogue going. So that really is the community outreach that we have through that. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about what I do and it's, it's I gave you the brief introduction. It's matthewsplace.com. I hope you guys will all go check it out. Um, it was started originally as an online village, particularly for rural youth who didn't have a community center that they could go to um, to talk about LGBTQ plus issues. Um, it's sort of evolved from that uh, because I know even where I live in Denver, there are kids right in my community who can't get to a community center and it's difficult um, and so it's evolved to sort of encompass all youth but with some particular uh, focus on um, connecting kids and sort of the reason behind why why do this uh, four out of ten youth say the community live isn't accepting LGBTQ youth um, LGBTQ youth are twice as likely to be physically assaulted kicked or shoved at school um, two out of 10 students say this affects their exams, their grades, and their class performance. Um, and 75% of these kids say that they can be more honest about themselves online than they can in real life. Which is 
where we sort of step in. 92% um, say they hear negative messages about being LGBTQ at school, online, or from their peers. And so what we've tried to do is create a safe space that's moderated, um, and we've talk, tackled a really, a whole host of all kinds of issues from um, self-harm. These are people speaking from their own experiences, talking about self-harm, suicide attempts, depression, questioning gender identity, um, eating disorders, body image, dysmorphia issues, just plain old coming out, how hard that can be. Um, and so taking into account that we have a population of youth who, for lack of a better word, they're vulnerable. They are vulnerable because of the negative, it, negative messages that they're hearing in their communities, their churches, from their families, from their people at school, teachers, it could be all over the place, um, to really try to moderate this, but to allow kids the space to talk about real things, to say, I'm depressed, here's my issue, I'm lonely, and I've thought about hurting myself, and to offer up resources to help connect people to things um, that can potentially help them. But, but part of that is just giving them a space to speak and a space to be because uh, mainstream media may not care what a 14-year-old queer kid in rural uh, Minnesota thinks about what it means to come out or to question their gender identity, but we care about it. And um, part of what is so important and what drives that is something that Judy Shepard talks a lot about, and it's the power of sharing your story. And why does it matter? Why should we share our story? Why do I need to come out at the grocery store when the cashier tells me, that's a beautiful ring that your husband gave you. And I say, thank you, it's from my wife. So why is that important? Why do we share, why do we share those stories? Well, it may change that cashier's perspective on things. And so it also gives youth a platform to say, this is who I am, and other youth can identify with it. Um, yeah, I am, okay. I took my glasses off, I shouldn't have done that. So, to build on, on this idea of helping people find the strength to use their voice, the opposite piece of that uh, same strategy is to help people find the courage to be great listeners, help allies find the courage to stand up for their LGBTQ loved ones, parents, employers, teachers, peers, um, paper route clientele, whatever it may be, um, creating the safe space for people to be authentic requires the space to be defined, and the space is the lives of the people who surround each of us. So in addition to urging people to dig deep and find the strength to come out, Judy Shepard and, and the foundation ask people to, to, to dig a little deeper themselves and find the space to help that happen, to project love, unconditional acceptance, safety, warmth to the people in our lives who we reasonably feel and are usually right might be struggling with the decision to come out. Um, and none of this work is helped by the media. The foundation gets plenty of media attention. Judy Shepard will go to a town. She'll get plenty of media attention for the broader mission of what she's done it's coming, to, it's coming to River City, you know. Judy's gonna be here tomorrow. We did a phone interview with her. Here's what she's all about. It's 7 p.m. at the Civic Auditorium. Admission is free. Um, but what she's telling people has to happen in a deeply private and personal way and in a deeply personal space. And we, no amount of media attention can help make that piece happen. Uh, that requires people to wanna live that way. They, it may help them be educated about having the choice presented to them. Uh, we're very hopeful that that media coverage, in fact, does get the opportunity in front of people. But to take that leap and do it, that comes from inside. And the newspaper or Channel 2 is not going to make that happen for you. And organizing around the idea that we're trying to get people to do this in large numbers all across the country and in the world is 
only tangentially helped by media attention. Um, what will help it is seeing our peers and people like us make that decision. Um, in some ways, I think social media may be the piece that is the most relevant to that work. And that's the work that will achieve our mission, millions of people deciding they won't live in a world full of hate anymore. That's the choice everybody can make and put us out of business. Um, but it requires everybody acting in concert to do the same thing um, and to mean it. So our grassroots organizing around that is one town at a time, one classroom at a time, one Laramie Project production at a time, one reader of Matthew's Place at a time, one symposium at a time. Um, what we rely upon for that to have any hope of effectiveness is that every person those individual conversations touch multiply the message and take it on as a cause of their own. Um, this is how some other grassroots driven social movements in our country have unfolded. The civil rights movement depended on the mass decision making and action of millions of people, particularly in the old confederacy. Uh, the recognition of the epidemic of uh, domestic violence uh, and the, the similar uh, work around prevention uh, of sexual assault. These are sensitive issues that required individual people to redefine how they viewed interpersonal behavior and what types of safety and guarantees of well-being and of justice are promised to people who are survivors of those phenomena. And that, that work, I, I had a meeting yesterday with a senior manager at uh, the Blue Bench in Denver, which used to be called the Rape Assistance and Awareness Project, which started out of the firmly held and correct belief that there was not enough conversation and education going on around sexual assault prevention issues. And it was an all-women-led organization which has grown over the years, uh, now has um, uh, made some positive steps in introducing this topic into male spaces where it needs to be talked about, uh, where ultimately the, the uh, ability of our society to address this problem rests there. Uh, cannot be completed without uh, male uh, culture uh, fully taking on board this, this, this understanding of their joint responsibility for their behavior in any way, including violent behavior. So they've had some media attention recently. There is a famous comedian who's been in the news for some accusations surrounding his behavior over the last several decades. Uh, which has inflamed and polarized this conversation. Uh, there was a story in a major national magazine about a university back east that has been picked apart and has produced a conversation that's been very devastating for survivors of sexual assault. And those who work in this movement are feeling battered by these waves of media coverage and watching the conversation get heated and out of, out of grasp. Uh, and they're concerned because three of their social workers have uh, chosen to move on in the last six months and they're having tremendous turnover because of burnout issues. Um, there's some good that's coming about from these conversations, but the people who've been trying to get them done in an orderly and, and in a sensitive and in a personal way have taken it on the chin as it's become uh, a media uh, frenzy in, in recent months. So. Um, the absence of media can be a real help to your messaging if you're trying to get into people's hearts. And um, if you find yourself enjoying media coverage, so to speak, um, it, it's, it, it's very important that you try as much as possible to control where that conversation's going because it can really step on the progress that, that you're already making. Um, I guess Sean will conclude. Yeah, I just had a quick point too when I was listening to you about listening that, um, and this also speaks to outrage. A lot of the conversations that I've been having lately with, you know, in my work has to do with allies and being gentle to people who want to be allies. 
um, because sometimes it'll happen that someone who is outside of this conversation wants to help and just doesn't necessarily know how and makes a misstep. They might use a wrong word. They might, you know, uh, be ignorant of the whole thing and say something that could be offensive. And I've heard a number of different stories that said, well, you know, I, I wanted to help and I said this and I just got jumped on. I just absolutely got jumped on. I'm never going back to that meeting again. You know, so for those of us who are within this conversation, if you hear someone who makes a misstep or says something or wants to learn, it would be my encouragement to be gentle with them. If, you, if they say something that's offensive, they might not know it. A lot of times, believe it or not, people say crap, the toads just fly right out of their mouth and they have no idea that what they've said is offensive to you. So a little gentle correction, but we don't want to chase away people who want to help us. Thanks, good point. Um, kind of wrapping up here before we get to uh, Q&A portion for anyone who has questions. I think the main point that we're really trying to leave you with here is social justice is a conversation. At the end of the day, it's about connecting with another person or a group of people. And within that conversation, you know, get mad, get passionate, do whatever you need to do to really get that point across. But don't, don't break each other down or fight with one another to get that media spotlight, to get that attention. If you're having that conversation with people in your house, in your schools, in your community, when you travel, when you go to symposiums like this and you come from all over the state to meet people who are you know, like-minded and doing the same work you are and working toward the same goal, that's what matters. Use the media that you have or that you can produce. You know, find how to collaborate, write a play, make a short film, write a poem, a collection of poems, a short story, anything that you think is gonna really connect with people and get into their hearts. We have found that it's very successful and we continue to do it 17 years later for that exact reason, and there's no sign of it stopping at this point. At this point, if anyone has any questions, if anyone has any comments, anything you'd like to present to us, we're, yeah, we're, we'd like to open that up now. I feel like, yep, they're gonna be coming around with the mic. Please raise your hand and I'll come to you with the mic. Let's take advantage. Come on. Don't fight. There you go. Yeah, and please wait for the mic. Thank you. Um, so my students and I do social justice programming at the University of Northern Colorado. And I think one of the things that all of us had learned early on in our social justice work was how to effectively facilitate those conversations. And so as those of you who um, even in posting media that starts a facilitation, what are kind of the essential aspects do you feel um, of that facilitation process with social justice work? Hey Jason, you ready? Uh, sure. <laughs> I think Susan could probably address this too, but um, provocative questions have to be asked to get people to really feel like they want to participate in a public dialogue, right? I, everybody was just fighting for that microphone over there a second ago because public dialogue is so enticing. Um, but you can get past people's inhibitions if you strike, you know, the head of the nail. Um, and I think the most I, the most important thing to do is to be direct about what you're trying to tell people. Like, there's a lot of sugarcoating you can do. I, I think one of the reasons Judy and Dennis Shepard are so effective is because they are ordinarily situated, extraordinary people, if that makes sense to you. They are middle class, middle American. They like all the same TV shows you all do. Judy would love to talk to you all about, you know, mass media, singers, cultural phenomena. She's in the same world we're all in but she has this extraordinary life story and this message that is a super painful thing for people to contemplate. They meet her and understand like the loss and the media spotlight and their life being upended and they just, it's provocative and so they wanna talk. And so I think a powerful personal story that's disarming and a little disturbing is one of the best things a social act advocacy movement has got. And the work that we do that's the most effective surrounds the most raw, blunt, honest delivery of what that story is all about and encourages people to share the very similar things that have happened to an awful lot of them. Want to add to that? Yeah, uh, I think I'm fortunate in the work that I do because I have a built-in background um, because usually the cast of whatever show I'm working with is there and they always have something to say. So if we open it up, you know, and as Jason said, everybody wants to be second to talk and there's just crickets in the room for right now, I just turn to the cast and say, what has what do you have to say about the, 
being involved in this work. And that always opens the floodgates. For me, the facilitation process, I think it's different in every case, but it's for me to be able to stay focused. So that if someone wants to, for lack of a better term, hijack the conversation into, you know, uh, for example, gay marriage, which is very important and a good thing, but not what we're talking about right here after the Laramie Project for this hour. So it's like, if you want to talk about that, come on, catch me afterwards and we'll talk about that. But right now we're sticking with this. And that's not necessarily an easy thing to do, and especially with all of the outrage and that we're seeing more and more of because you don't want to offend people. And I try really hard not to offend people and go, eh, no, we're not talking about that, you know. But there is, you do have to keep it focused to what it is that you're trying to get across because otherwise it'll be diffused. I mean, you know, it's not like the foundation doesn't want to help with the children being murdered in Atlanta or this issue or that issue or world hunger. It's not that we don't think that's important. It's just if you have a group or an organization that's trying to solve every one of the world's problems, nothing will get done. So for me, it's focus. Okay. Any more? More questions? Awesome. So with like today's modern age of like social media with like Instagram and Facebook, um, what kind of advice would you like say for like teenagers, like regardless of their sexual orientation to like stay away from like, like um, with trying to make people like comfortable and not trying to make a bad name for people of the LGBT community? Like what kind of advice would you say um, for people. Yeah, I was going to say, Christina is probably going to have a lot to say. I have a few of those turn into me a, a once a week or so. Um, I don't think it has to do with being LGBTQ plus. My advice to youth is don't put anything on the internet that you don't want to see on the cover of the New York Times that you wouldn't want your grandma to see and your aunts to see and for that to come up 20 years later. And you have, to, so to me, that's what I always tell them, that it's okay and it's good to share, but think before you hit publish, before you hit send, because you, you can't take it back. It's not like when I was in high school and we had notes you could burn, I suppose. It's not like that anymore. And so it's less about making people comfortable f for me. I think that it's okay for people to be a little bit uncomfortable. I think it's okay for me to make that cashier who made the assumption about me a little uncomfortable, to challenge her assumptions. But what I tell youth is, do you want to see this in a job interview? 10 years from now, because it's gonna be there. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Just as far as social media go, I mean, I kind of got dragged kicking and screaming into social media land because it's, you know, I had my, these guys and my teenagers teach me stuff, and now I'm like the Facebook queen, but and Twitter and all that sort of stuff. My thing would be very simple, and you've heard it before, don't feed the trolls. When you're interacting, don't feed the trolls because they're out there trying to get, a, if you see a post and you are like, it, it's like standing and yelling at Fred Phelps in the Westboro Baptist Church, it just gives them a platform and just allows them to yell louder. So, I mean, there are times when, you know, you want to like, what the heck did that person, and you really want to react to that, think about it because you're feeding the troll because then they'll react and then another troll will come in and then pretty soon it all explodes and it's not a useful conversation because you can't win it. You can't win that anonymous troll thing. As an example, y'all ever hear of Memories Pizza in No Names Town, Indiana? Anybody ever heard of this place? Yeah. <laughs> Channel... 406 or whatever in this town in the middle of nowhere, Indiana, sorry if anyone's from Indiana, not my favorite place these days, went and asked the pizza lady, would you, what about, you know, they're, they're going to say you can't discriminate against gay couples anymore. And, and they said if there was a gay wedding, they wouldn't cater it because they don't believe in that. 
if they are saying they don't believe in pizza being served at a wedding reception, I think we're on the same team on that one, but <laughs> they didn't say it out of an abundance of goodwill and Christian love for me. Um, so, well, guess what happened? We all know what happened, right? They became the internet poster children for ignorant people who should just shut up. And then they immediately became the poster children for, oh my God, the evil homosexual agenda is attacking these nice Christian people, let's send them money. And Glenn Beck went on his absurd internet TV channel he whipped up and raised a million damn dollars for these people. And now that's what happened. And it happened because some people who were angry, I might be one of them, but I didn't go call them or threaten them or send them anything nasty or anything. I just thought like, holy smokes, this, this is crazy. But because some people did that, they became martyrs, they became heroes, and now they're wealthy people. And this happened right here in Wyoming. Anyone remember Lynn Hutchings, who was in the House of Representatives a couple years back? There was quite a debate about whether, you know, people like me ought to be treated the same as everybody else. She, she was of the opinion, no, on that. And she said some pretty offensive things about how dare we be, consider ourselves part of the civil rights movement because it's a choice. We weren't born that way. Never minding that for a minute, she got all kinds of nasty threats and racist remarks and other crap in her email and she went and cried a river that rafted her down to the speaker's office where they came out on the floor of the House of Representatives and told everyone how appalling the public's treatment of Representative Hutchings was and it would not be tolerated by the leadership of that institution and gave her an opportunity to go from being misguided wrong person to champion of morality and standing up to the indecent threateners. So huge, huge risk in sharing your anger with people like that. We are not gonna build a more loving world that way. And just a quick pizza note as the mic is headed back here. There is a crowd rise now called virtual pizza that's in response to that crowdfunding and no, no, this is great. They're trying to raise money to put up um, homeless LGBTQ youth in a hotel for a year, and that's what they're going to use the money for. So the people who are backlashing on that money being raised, that's their backlash for that virtual pizza. Yeah. <clears throat> By the way, who knew that we would have so much to say on this question, but I also have a point to make as well. <laughs> um, a large part of my job at the foundation is I manage all of our social media outlets day-to-day um, -day basis, which is a lot of time scouring the internet for the most relevant or topical, whatever. Um, and two points on that are one, part of my job, at least the way that I operate it, is that I sometimes really, really want to make people uncomfortable in the fact that they have to think about something they may have not thought of before. Um, that's not to say I'm trying to find the most provocative article to share or put out there, but if it's a different perspective that even I myself, I'm like, maybe teetering on, I want to know what the dialogue about that is. There is a benefit to p getting people out of their comfort zone sometimes, not, you know, at the sake of your own comfort or, you know, what you want to do or what you're <clears throat> enjoying with social media. But the other thing that you need to realize is a lot of times it's not so much what you're posting, but what you're sharing. There's a lot out there like the backlash of, you know, this is funny that the these developers bought a web domain for a pizza place that was being, you know, a little bigoted, a little ignorant, and a little outspoken, and then the backlash is now they have all this funding to continue being that way. When you're sharing things, you have to make sure that you really believe it, you have to really know where it's coming from, and you have to really know what it's saying. And if there's any uncertainty at all, don't. Just leave it where it is, and don't spread something that could potentially be harmful. Um, any other questions, or also, are we out of time? I think we could take one more question. Let's do one last question. Okay. Cool. Katie. Hi. Um, hi. <clears throat> uh, instead of responding to something negative, if a social injustice happened and the people around you don't care and you want to raise awareness for it, would a media or would media be a good outlet for that? Because I know in some cases it is, but other cases media will twist your story into a negative thing. Or would like reaching out to your local community be a better way of doing that? <laughs> I think right off the bat, especially if it is something, if it's an injustice that's happening at home, if it's in your community, 
addressing the community first is always going to be best because you're going to get much more of a dialogue going that could then turn into a media story but i feel like a lot of what we're doing is rushing to a media outlet right away just leaves you vulnerable to losing control of that and it spins out of control because at the same time in theory technically allegedly it's the media's job to find both sides and you're inviting people who might work against you into a problem before you even really know what the temperature of that problem is in your community. Does anyone else have? Cool. Just from, from our background, the candlelight vigils that happened for Matt were spontaneous. They were all, I talked to a guy in Chicago who went to a candle business, like a candle wholesaler and asked them to f give him as many candles as they, as he, could because he wanted to do a candlelight vigil for Matt Shepard in Chicago all those years ago. Um, and that's how they happened all over the country. People spontaneously decided they wanted to do that and organized through progressive organizations, institutions, churches mostly. Also special church sermons um, are, are a great way to get the message out. Someone can be invited to the pulpit at a special service, a memorial service. They can be held outdoors like the one at the Newman Center for Matt was. These are peaceful somewhere between celebration, protest, and observation of the serious thing that happened. It helps focus the community's attention and give everyone a, an opportunity to be there or be part of it, rather than to be the re, re, on the receiving end of communication. They're invited to participate in shared feeling. I think that's a much better model for crowd action. And that certainly through social media and, and traditional media can propagate if you're able to put something like that together, it can really mushroom into the conversation you're looking to have, I think. Okay, are we doing, do, are we doing one more, are we good? No, yeah. I think, oh, was there one more? Okay. We'll make it, we'll make it brief, we promise. It's fine, it's a brief question. <laughs> Um, so a lot of the conversation around social justice work that happens on our campus at UNC has been about um, trying to balance that with like the emotional cost and like the um, effort you have to extend to be in these spaces all of the time. So like what would be some advice you have about taking care of yourself while also staying um, like driven to do this work? All right, Susan, I'm gonna go right to you right away. You have a lot of experience in this. I, I do, but I don't have the answers. I mean, well, Jason and I were just talking about all the travel that we were doing and that how it's very, I mean, it's very difficult to say no. You know, if someone, want, we were trying to squeeze in a trip to Virginia between the trip to Oregon and the trip to Chicago and who could go and, you know, it's very difficult to not try to do everything for everybody all the time. And, and for me, I, I, I guess it's a little simplistic, but I use a picture analogy. You know, it's that, well, there's, there's two sorts of pictures. I mean, stress is cumulative. So whatever stress you have going on in your life, if it's with the work that you do and your family and then your kids and then you're all that sort of stuff, it doesn't like diminish. It, it will just keep on top of each other and overflow. So, you know, then you also with your work or our work, we, here's this other picture and we're pouring ourselves out and pretty soon we're empty and we got nothing. So I think it's an individual thing of what is it that fills you up? What is it that helps you? For me, uh, I'll con these guys all know this, it's to sit down and watch the latest episode of Outlander, you know, and not feel guilty about it because I've got work to do and I should answer that email and blah, blah, blah. No, just sit down and do it. Go take a walk, you know, uh, uh, play with your dog, take your kids to the movie, you know, whatever it is that, that fills you up. The linchpin that I have a hard time getting a hold of is not feeling guilty about it. So, you know, um, we say take care of yourself. You got to take care of yourself. Well, that's pretty wide. You have to figure out individually what that means. You know, does that mean buy yourself a ribeye steak and hole yourself into your apartment and eat it while you're watching the latest episode of Outlander? Maybe. You know, whatever it is that feeds your soul. You know, church. Um, it, it might be uh, singing in the shower. It might be um, going to a dance or, you know, something along those lines. For me, that's the only thing that I found because it lives in a dark world. You know, a lot of the work that we do. I go, I see the Laramie Project and I cry every time I go. I go back into that world and I see it and sometimes I see it three nights in a row. And then I have these 
conversations with people about all these horrible things that are going on in their lives and how to fix them. And sometimes it's hard to snap out of that. So, you know, if you have any um, ideas for me, Susan at MatthewShepherd.org, just send them to me too. I'd be happy to hear them. But that's really the only advice that I have. Anybody else? But, we're terrible at it, actually. Yeah, we're, we're the worst people to ask about this. Like, let's, we'll, we'll come to a symposium about that topic in a couple of weeks and we'll prepare a presentation for it. Um, for me, I mean, for me, it's like, it's, it's friends, it's the mountains, it's travel, it's... I th actually, if there's any way you can enjoy the social justice you've been fighting for, go ahead and do that. Because it's pretty rewarding. We got married this one time they were letting gay people get married in Colorado for some some reason. So we just went down to the county courthouse and signed, self-certified, got married. You got to swipe the credit card for $35 to do that. Um, it's a, and then we were married. Like, how many years have I been talking about? We all have a right to get married. We had to do this. Like, so we did it for fun, like spontaneously, all of a sudden, after all that, it was like, here's your, here you go, you're married now. How, how is, is that working for you? Like, <laughs> it was the oddest, funniest, most magical, kind of hilarious thing. Like, the social change movement that so many tears were shed over, so many tragic stories, so many people who went to the grave never knowing this pleasure um, all of a sudden, guess what? It's just happened. Like, it's real. And I don't know why, but I liked it better that way. That it wasn't like straggling to the mountaintop, finally. It was, everything changed. Oh, society changed its mind about that. We can move on to employment non-discrimination and a million other issues, but, and, and we will. But that one, you, that, that got fixed. And so we were able to enjoy that. And I still think about it. I'm like, oh my God, I'm married. <laughs> um, yeah, so, when you hear the angels sing. Yeah. yeah. When you hear them sing. The yeah. equality you're yeah. fighting yeah. for, the yeah. dignity, yeah, yeah. The, the dignity you want, the treatment you think everyone deserves. If you're getting a piece of that out there anywhere, go enjoy it. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you again so much. Uh, if you guys have questions and want to chat with our panel, um, come on up. We have uh, groups outside. They're going to take those of you who want to go on a tour. Uh, Luke and Rachel, will you guys wave? Rachel's out there waving. Okay, so she will take you. So enjoy the afternoon, and they will get you to the, um, to the dance also. Any of you who want to come to the late night dance, it starts at 9 o'clock at the Civic Center.